I'll give you a taste from the recent book, and I'll add my thanks, like Grace, the Neil Asli and the Blood Axe Posse, spearheaded by Neil for revitalizing the poetic scene. And I'm sure Imtiaz would agree. And I've met Christine after about 20 years speaking on the phone. And they have a new boy on the block, Mr. Digital, I think Neil referred to him. I'm not sure. Pete. So, long life to Blood Axe. This new collection covers various voices and centuries. The first one I'll do is in the voice of the potato, the staple diet of the Inca civilization, endorsed by Marie Antoinette as a great way to feed the poor, looked at with suspicion by Europe after the Spanish introduced it because the gnarled shape of the potato was felt to cause the gnarled hands of leprosy. But A. A. Milner of Winnie the Pooh said this, what I say is that if a man really likes potatoes, he must be a pretty decent sort of fellow. Potato speaks. Call me Spud, Tatty, Pratty, Fries. I'm not fussed. In a womb of earth I lie, a curled up fetus. My flesh. My gift, whatever your color or status. And though I admit that a potato a day may not, like apple, keep the doctor away, I stand here to say my piece, come what may. But before I potato on peel, my point of view, may I remind the citizens of the red, white, and blue of my abduction from my homeland, Peru. I, your humble, taken for granted tuba, whom you douse in ketchup, salt, vinegar, I who am both foreigner and indigenous, now inseparable kin to your fish and chips, I who fill with warmth the freezing famished, well adapted to British kitchen and kinship, I'll gladly bear the brunt of whatever sin you lay at my wrinkled door, like that famine, the root of Ireland's flesh and blood uprooting. But wasn't it your A.A. Milner, and I quote, who said that any man who really likes potatoes must be a pretty decent sort of fellow, Sorry, folks, no disrespect, I assure you, to the creator of cuddly Winnie the Pooh. But I've known potato lovers of fascist view. Suckers for potatoes, fried, roasted, mashed, boiled, yet from closeness to the stranger, they recoil preferring the stranger to keep to elsewhere soil. Meanwhile, I'll be there for you, ever at your side, there, at home, on your plate. I happily reside, the edible prophet 
surveying all through blind eyes. And this one, a quintessential flag, the flag is addressing the nations of the world. I've come a long way from ribbons on spears and garlands of feathers heading a fanfare of tribal others. Now nations march to the grammar of my squares and rectangles, not to mention the odd triangle, on grand parades, you'll see me displayed to the height of my glory, the center of ritual attention. But I stay calm and carry on as any flag worth its weight in cloth would do. Up a pole, down a pole, ever playing my starring role in the fabric of a nation's unfolding of what's known as independence. How I have danced in the neutral breeze for monarchs overseas and seen the colors of my self reshuffle for the long shackle about to step into their own stride, for I too have heard of that feeling called national pride from the well-informed lips of the transatlantic winds that keep me flapping as well as up to date on history's shifting weight, those winds that bring me Tidings of risings and uprisings of timely severings from a mother country's absentee apron strings. A people defined by empires still visible specter rebirthing into their own mirror. And so, at midnight's chime, I become a banner for a milestone beginning, hoisted skywards as a fluttering monument to the future. And when freedom tolls, see how I lord it on my stately pole to trumpet and drum roll. And in the reckoning hour when old rages grow mute, I command a multitude salute and a speechless minute falls across the land. Oh, what would the United Nations, the Commonwealth, the Latin American Confederation, the Arab Emirates, in short, the globe, do without the likes of me? And all, 
my colorful kin. We whose silent tongue is flaunted in the wind, therefore unravel what hidden meaning you will from my flying geometry of colors, full mass. I am an emblem of protocol and celebration, half mass. I am the drooping shroud of mass. Lamentation to you who wave me from the bonded crowd. What words can a flag offer beyond the fervor of slogans? that shadow my rainbow. Yet, since a flag also knows how it feels to be thrown to the fury of flames, and I shall call no names, on behalf of every flag, I ask of all who wave me to order. Am I the mere clot you brandish to a marching creed basking in the vanquished? Or am I a nation's handkerchief flown from a flagstaff of justice as democratic as sun and moon. In the 80s, I coined an expression, Poetsonian because of my regard for the inventive satirical lyrics of the Calypsonian. A poet like John Cooper Clark draws from the punk energy, Linton Crazy Johnson, for example, from reggae. But going back in time, it's fascinating how poets have drawn from that musical genre. Jill Scott Heron drawing from, shall we say, embryonic rap and uh, the, the, the black African, African-American storytelling tradition. But this is nothing new, though some people created that polarized division between what they call performance poetry and so-called literary. Well, Dante was a, a lovely performance poet, um, you know, belting out um, at wrong banquets. Catullus and Ovid, Roman poets, were also you know, performing at reclining banquets. So it's a very um, tricky um, division because poetry is so close to song and music, even the language, iambic, foot. You've got to move it, ballad, dance. You've got to do something, shake something. <laughs> this is diversity in the market. And um, one of my um, modes of poetsonia, to learn how this thing, diversity, does operate, I went by Brixton Market to investigate how the fruit and veg them does integrate. I saw apple and mango conversing cozily. Ripe planting had no quarrel with broccoli. Aubergine don't bear grudge against piri piri. I was impressed how pineapple spoke 
sweetly. And when red pepper responded discreetly, I knew the fruit and veg them could teach a nation the secret of harmonious cohabitation. So if you want to learn about this thing, diversity, observe, but not squash, and the little lychee. In the fruit and veg them market, it was plain to see the red, yellow, purple, and green live in harmony. The fruit and veg them show each other respect. Cucumber never raise a finger to cojet. Now, if you don't mind, Newcastle, let me hear you, Newcastle, line by line after this chorus. In the fruit and veg the market, it was plain to see. The red, yellow, purple, and green live in harmony. The fruit and veg them show each other respect. Cucumber never raise a finger to courget. Then I saw salt fish chatting up chorizo, like the two of them does talk the same lingo. Gammon and mackerel held no grievance. Black pudding and salami struck up alliance. So if you want to learn about social etiquette, just study the ways of oxtail, veal, brisket. In the fish and meat market, it was plain to see the black, white, pink, and brown live in harmony. The fish and meat them show each other respect. I never see a fight between two fillet yet. Never see a fight between two fillet yet. I did mention that this poet cuts across voices. Um, I hope I've got time to end with two. Not too long. Is that all right, Linda? This is in the voice of ice. You heard potatoes speak. This is in the voice of ice. And then I'll end with weeds. Not what you were thinking. I'm thinking serious gardening, if you know what I mean. Anyway, ice speaks. Must I remind the short memoried humankind of a once upon a woolly mammoth time? when my permafrost embraced continents, my ghostly glaciers extending their grimace to white out a Neanderthal dawn and do my bit for what's called extinction. But let me say, I'm not all doom and gloom. No, I do have my chilled out moments. Like when I become the crystal sediments cushioned in your cocktail glass, the chorus in your lemonade, the loud castaway in your rum. Now it saddens me to see talking primates skating their span of time on thin ice to borrow a common idiom. For when the day of reckoning comes and my melting cap doffs its sub-zero self, Prepare your high-rise stone to weep upon my lap of water rising by the hourglass. But under my hard edges I'm a real softy. For what are freak floods and tsunamis 
if not that my tears returning home to roost. Yes, my Leviathan grief seeking out the crevices of your fading green so disturbed my frozen sleep, and I, ice, will release the weeping god of me. Both myself and Grace had a fling with gardening during lockdown, overnight gardening. I never dreamt I will hear that voice saying, John, Monty Dom is on. <laughs> and I'm saying, uh, Grace, I think you've got Alan Titmarsh about to begin, and there's clips from the Chelsea Ch Flower Show. And I, you know, as, as poets, you pinch ideas. So as a budding gardener, and I, I, I was touched that uh, Monty Dom said, you must pick your, I'm giving you a, a tip here. Many of you might not know, even though you're green-fingered. You pick your tomatoes off the tree, and freeze them so the birds don't get them. And I've said this to some seasoned gardeners, and they said, oh, John, I must try that. Oh, and I was quite pleased with that. Um, I'll end with weeds. For just happening to be in the wrong place, you are well maligned, labeled parasite, invader, trespasser, in short, non grata, the unwelcome guest with no plan to depart in the near future. The laid back scrunges who make their bed wherever they creep, but with such poetic names to live up to, you have nothing to prove but unwind your thriving plot where you ought not, like that lawn where you intrude crabgrass, goose grass, Quack grass, whatever name you choose to bind and abide by, wasn't it a, a blade of grass that old Whitman rhapsodized as the handkerchief of the Lord? As far as metaphors go, that's certainly arresting, but even God's handkerchief shouldn't be seen waving through cracks in one's decking, or pride of joy, crazy paving, not to mention hijacking one's Zen-inspired pathway. It's gravel, now the backing for your foreground breeding. But is it wise to uproot your silent parable of live and again let live. See how the very stones are more than content to forget and forgive, rubbing easy shoulders with your green insurgents. Thank you very much. <laughs>